Hey guys, how are you doing today? I hope you're doing well. Uh, I actually just got off work and I'm getting ready to go to bed, to be honest with you. Um, but I am excited to, to finish out this section in chapter 9 of the book of Hebrews for you. Uh, but I do want to say that I, I miss you guys greatly and I hope that you are doing well and that you're getting some time to really dig into God's Word, um, and that you're encouraged by it, uh, especially in uh, frustratingly difficult times like these. Um, I've got some, some things laid out for us here as we kind of move on uh, deeper into chapter 9. Uh, we started chapter 9, we went verses 1 through 10, and we're going to do 11 through 15 here. Um, and I'm not really going to lay them out sequentially in order and just read the big chunk of text what I want to do is I want to look at what we did with 1 through 10 and then lay it up against verses 11 through 15 because I believe the author of Hebrews is trying to make a pretty big comparison so we can see the differences between the Old Testament and uh, the old the old covenant and in the new covenant and what Jesus has done for us so uh, I, I did want to make a correction from last time as I was going back and kind of re-listening to what I was talking about. At one point I talked about when we feel the weight of our sin and we feel um, the, the, the grief in our spirit uh, owning up to what we've done. And, and I, I had made mention of this idea that I could pray or I could read the Bible and not really feel free um, from that sin. And it's, I want to be clear, Bible reading and prayer help us. They draw us closer to God, but they do so by the leading of the Spirit. And if we pray and read our Bible because it's just the right thing to do, <clears throat> and we think that that will give us some right standing before God, then we're just, you know, we're, we're mocking God and we're trying to earn our forgiveness. And in that sense, Bible reading and prayer won't help us because it's not being correctly motivated by the Spirit. And I just wanted to make that clear. If, if yes, you're feeling the weight of your sin, yes, you are um, struggling, you know, but you begin to pray and read the Bible and the Spirit begins to draw you in, that is the work of the Spirit. It is exactly where you should be. It's exactly what you should be doing. And don't just, you know, shove that off. <clears throat> so let me jump into this week. I want to look at three specific sections of, uh, of the text, and we're going to just lie, lay a section of verses from 1 through 10 up against a section of verses from 11 through 15 and see how they line up. So the first section is uh, it's chapter 9, verses 1 through 5, and it's the earthly tabernacle versus the heavenly tabernacle mentioned in chapter or in verse 11. So let me read chapter 9, verses 1 through 5. Now the first covenant had regulations for worship and also an earthly sanctuary. A tabernacle was set up. In its first room were the lampstand and the table with its consecrated bread. This was called the holy place. Behind the second curtain was a room called the most holy place, which had a golden altar or the yeah, golden altar of incense and the gold covered ark of the covenant. This ark contained a gold jar of manna, Aaron's staff that had budded, and the stone tablets of the covenant. Above the ark were the cherubim of the glory, overshadowing the atonement cover. So this is just a description of the Old Testament tabernacle, uh, the, the mobile temple that was, uh, that was with the, the people of Israel as they wandered the wilderness uh, until the temple was formed. Uh, let's move on and look at uh, what I believe the, the author is juxtaposing with that temple or with that tabernacle in, in verse 11 here. But when Christ came as high priest of the good things that are now already here, he went through the greater and more perfect tabernacle that is not made with human hands. That is to say, is not a part of this creation. The earthly tabernacle, uh, as we've learned, it, it followed a pattern that was laid out by God in the book of Exodus. Uh, this pattern uh, was a shadow of what is actually in heavenly places, but it's just a mere shadow. Uh, there's a song by the, by the group 
called Salos. It's P-S-A-L-L-O-S. And they did a book for every passage in the book of Hebrews. They did a song for every passage in the book of Hebrews. And it's just wonderful. So Google this band with Hebrews, and it's going to pop up for you. <clears throat> and one of the songs, it actually uh, has a, a, a line that sings like this. It, it says, There are shadows on the ground, and it makes you think that there is something so much better up above. The light shines down, and the darkness shrinks from a true and heavenly light. And the song is expressing how much better the source of light is than the shadow that it casts. Uh, this source, this heavenly tabernacle, is where Jesus entered as our high priest, and in doing so, showed himself greater than the old covenant. His entrance into this place, into this heavenly exalted place that, that God uses... <clears throat> This pattern that he gives to Moses, uh, just to 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 almost condescend to us and explain to us some of the glorious things in heaven that are really outside of our comprehension. Um, this uh, this type and this shadow that he casts for us in the tabernacle is just a a, a way that he gives us a pinhole view of the glory. Uh, that is in these heavenly places. This is where Jesus enters in to offer sacrifice, to offer himself for us before the Father. And uh, and we're going to move on, and, and but it's going to show, uh, it's going to continue to show what the author of this book has been trying to show throughout. Jesus is greater. He's better than everything than anything, than anyone, than any Old Testament institution, than anything we've done before, than anything we've ever seen. Jesus is better. So uh, let's not get caught up in the weeds. Well, that's not a weed. That's the real point of the whole book. Nevertheless, uh, let's go back to the section on the earthly, earthly portion, and let's look at verses 6 and 7. Uh, it's the service of the priests. So verse 6. When everything had been arranged like this, the priests entered regularly into the outer room to carry on their ministry, but only the high priest entered uh, the inner room, and that only once a year, and never without blood, which he offered for himself and for the sins the people had committed in ignorance. That's the, the Old Covenant. Let's look at the New Covenant, verse 12. He, Jesus, did not enter by means of of the blood of goats and calves, but he entered the most holy place once for all by his own blood, thus obtaining eternal redemption. Uh, think of the ministry of the priests. Uh, it was continual. It was limited in its access to the presence of God. Uh, the regular priests only got into that one special room, uh, maybe once during their entire service as a priest. Uh, and then only the high priest, once a year, had access to the Holy of Holies. He had to, the high priest had to offer sacrifices for his sins before he could go offer sacrifices for the sins of the people. He had to cleanse himself again and again. And even at that, his view of the mercy seat and the ark, uh, his view was obscured by smoke uh, from the ever-burning incense that was on the, uh, that, the bronze altar of incense or the golden altar of incense, uh, his visits to the Holy of Holies were not confident visits. Uh, they were anxious moments. Uh, and, and the people, imagine being a person in that time. You were relying, hoping, clinging to the sacrifices that this high priest was about to make on your behalf and praying that it was acceptable before God. Uh, these were tense, tense moments. Um, this arrangement where people were just hoping to be made clean. But how much better is it now that our new high priest didn't enter into the heavenly, you know, so much better, heavenly holy of holies, by the insufficient blood of animals. No, he entered uh, into this place bearing his own blood, 
earlier the author talks about uh, how he was made perfect through the power of an indestructible life. The offering he bore in blood was perfect and worthy of obtaining uh, what the author calls here eternal redemption. His entry into this place was never to be repeated. It never says he left. It just says he entered, and now he resides there at the right hand of the Father, interceding for believers. He's lifting us up. He's sustaining us before God, before God the Father, even now. His sacrifice allowed him to enter once for all. The implication there is once. Once for all. For all time and for all people who are called according to his purposes. We can have confidence in the work of this high priest. The level of confidence here is uh, completely different. It's, it is the idea of, well, I'm going to get to it, but the idea of covering versus cleansing. And it's, it's, it's just a whole different ballgame. Uh, so we we've read through verses one through uh, one through five and then six and seven and then verse eight in the original portion here is is really a pivot verse where it says the Holy Spirit was showing by this that the way into the most holy place had not yet been disclosed as long as the first tabernacle was still functioning just like I was saying it, uh, last week verse eight is a real pivot point and it's saying that you can't have Jesus as your high priest you can't experience uh, this true freedom, this this true um, uh, liberation, if you are trying to rely on your ability to earn God's forgiveness and acceptance by offering sacrifices and trying to do the right things. You cannot white-knuckle your behavior and expect that God's going to just accept it and be like, you're good, we're good, you did enough. It's not like that. Um, that is old covenant, old tabernacle living, and you can't really experience the freedom uh, that Christ brings in the new covenant unless you let that go and cling to His sacrifice. So as long as you're, as long as uh, this first tabernacle was still functioning, uh, you couldn't get to that holy place. You didn't have access. Um, but in Jesus, God closed that altar, closed that tabernacle, so that through Jesus, we would be free in love to serve the living God instead of bound by this endless debt uh, that we could never earn our way out of. Uh, let's move to, to the, the close here. Um, I'm trying to not take a half an hour like I did last time. So... Uh, uh, verse 9 and 10 will express to us the, uh, the old sacrifices. And then verses 13 through 15 will speak of Jesus' ultimate sacrifices. So verses 9. Verse 9. <clears throat> this is an illustration for the present time, indicating that the gifts and sacrifices being offered were not able to clear the conscience of the worshiper. They are only a matter of food and drink and various ceremonial washings, external regulations applying until the end, uh, until the time of the new order, or until um, the Reformation, as, as some translations call it. So that's the old sacrifices, and then we'll read the, the author's juxtaposition of the new sacrifice, Jesus' sacrifice. Verse 13. The blood of goats and bulls, and the ashes of a heifer sprinkled on those who are ceremonial unclean, sanctify them so that they are outwardly clean. How much more then will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished, that's the power of the indestructible life that we read about earlier, how much more then will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciences from acts that lead to death, so that we may serve the living God. For this reason, Christ is the mediator of a new covenant, that those who are called may receive the, the promised eternal inheritance, now that he has died as a ransom to set them free from the sins committed under the first covenant. The blood of animals throughout the Old Testament was a means of covering, but it did little to change the heart of the worshiper. It was, 
it was meant to uh, to assuage the wrath of God. Think of uh, you, I. I you hear told in the story of Adam and Eve that when they sinned and they were cast out of the garden and they recognized that they were naked, that God made skins from animal hide and that those animals that were killed to provide that hide would be, quote unquote, the first sacrifices. Whether or not that that's true, but it, it, it does paint a picture that if that were the case, uh, in order to provide a covering, in order to provide clothes, but in this case, you know, the, the picture is, the analogy is a covering, um, something had to die. Blood had to be spilled. Uh, and then all throughout, the sprinkling of blood, you know, the, think of the Passover, um, the Passover rituals where they would paint the doorposts with the blood um, of a lamb. You know that it was it provided a covering. It provided um, an outward protective layer to an extent, um, but it, it didn't change the heart. There was always that that underlying tension of, am I really being, am I really in right relationship with the Father? Um, because I keep having to come back here every year and I keep on having to make the same sacrifices for the same stuff that is tripping me up, you know, day after day, month after month, year after year. These sacrifices did little to help that person. <laughs> we needed something more. The blood of Christ does not cover up our sins. It blots them out. It takes them away. They are remembered by the Father no more. And it is in that forgiveness, in the true cleansing, uh, that our consciences can be really freed up uh, to let that stuff go. And this cleansing, this, this removing of this weight from our conscience, it's not just for the sake of being clean. It's not just for the sake of, of a new start or being made into a new creation. We are made pure so that we would be free to serve the living God. It changes the motivation of our hearts, like God said he would do during in chapter 8, last chapter, when we discussed the new covenant. It, he would write his law on our minds, on our hearts. We are free to serve the living God because our consciences are clear instead of laboring and slaving away trying to please God in order to earn some kind of right standing. No, we are free from that old covenant. The old covenant, the old tabernacle, that altar is closed. No more sacrifices for sin are required. There is no earning it. There is no, I'm going to do all the right things. No, there is only casting ourselves at the feet of Christ and knowing that he has, um, he's become our mediator, our great high priest, uh, bearing himself as a sacrifice, the only sacrifice that we need to set us free from our sins. So um, let's pray and let's ask that God even now would, uh, would, would cleanse our consciences for us. God, we thank you uh, for the truth in your word. We ask that even now, by the power of your spirit, through the work of Christ, uh, on our behalf, that you would cleanse our consciences and that you would set us free to serve the living God. That you would set us free from these acts that lead to death and that you would make us a people who are eager to serve, eager to show the world um, the good works that you have set before us. Uh, even in these uncertain times, God, there, there should be an urgency in our hearts to serve you because of how great you are, because you have um, made a way for us to have access to that holy of holies, to your presence, God. Um, and, and I pray that you would just make that real to us even now and that you would, uh, 
you would apply that blood to us, that you would cleanse us, cleanse our consciences, set us free from, from guilt, set us free from shame, set us free from this idea that we can earn our salvation or that you look at us and see anything other than the blood of Jesus Christ. We pray, God, that you would uh, make that alive in our hearts and that you would uh, keep us safe, keep us healthy, uh, and bring us back together as soon as possible. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, once again, I love you guys. I miss you desperately. Um, but let's continue to stay safe and, uh, and uh, uh, trust that God will continue to put good acts, uh, good things, things that he wants us to do um, on our plates where we are and that we would look for ways to serve him where we are and be faithful where we are, and that when he brings us back together, we would uh, celebrate his faithfulness to us. So love you, miss you. Need anything, you give us a buzz. Uh, let, the, let the pastors know, let me know. Uh, anything we can do. Have a great one.